In terms of partisan neutrality, this map is not. It is a heavily partisan gerrymandered map. This week on KSL Plus. And there's always going to be one group that feels like they're underrepresented. A battle over boundaries. The blatant tearing apart of Salt Lake County into four congressional districts and the disenfranchisement of minority voters does not demonstrate impartial decision making. You have created a firestorm of opposition by treating the voters of Utah with disrespect. We want to know who drew the maps, what outside groups were consulted, and what was the rationale for decision. The opportunity only comes once every decade using new census data to reconfigure district maps for members of Congress, state legislators, and school boards. It's just an angry time politically, and you saw from some of the comments in there, uh, you know, how angry people are, you know, on both sides of the aisle. And it, it's hard to have a redistricting year when you're in the middle of all the national fights that we're in the middle of right now. I'm Matt Rascone, and this is KSL Plus. And this week, we're focusing on the congressional map and the controversy surrounding it. An independent commission submitted map proposals to the state legislative redistricting committee, but the committee instead supported a congressional map that divided up democratic leaning areas of Salt Lake County even more. At the time we're recording this, the Utah House and Senate have voted to pass the congressional district map and now goes to Governor Spencer Cox for a signature. In an internet town hall, Governor Cox said, He'll likely um, approve and, the maps uh, the, the legislature picks. That, that I, I do not have plans to veto these maps. Um, and and there's, there's some very specific reasons for that. And one being, we, we'll see what happens. Today, the congressional map passed with a veto-proof majority in, in the House. Um, I suspect, I've, I've been told, that the Senate has the, uh, the same numbers and will likely pass with a veto-proof majority. Um, I, I, if, if there's one thing you learn about me from these, you learn that I, I'm a very practical person. I'm, I'm not a bomb thrower. Um, um, and, uh, and I believe in, in good governance. And so uh, I, I've been told that uh, just, a, just a, a veto, um, just for the sake of a veto, is, 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 what, uh, is something that, that I should do. I, I just think that that's a mistake. Um, it's a mistake for, for lots of reasons, but the biggest of which is I, I get to work with this. And, and again, a veto-proof majority is a super majority. And, and uh, we have some incredible members of the legislature who work very hard on these. I, I know it's easy to, um, to, to speak of them and, and denigrate them. Um, and, uh, and, and sometimes they deserve that. Um, most of the time they do not. And, uh, and it's important for a governor to have a very close working relationship with the legislature. I can't pass laws despite what I get told all of the time. Um, I have zero legislative authority. Um, and so I have to rely to get our agenda done. And we have some incredible things we'll be working on. We'll be talking about those over the next few months. We have, we have a budget that, that we need to get passed that involves in, in increases, significant increases. In fact, maybe the most increases we've ever seen for education, specifically focused on our uh, low-income communities, in, uh, in, in, in our multicultural communities along the Wasatch Front, our at-risk students, um, and our rural students. Um, you're going to be seeing significant legislation around water um, and water conservation, um, all of these things that we need to do to lower the price of housing in our state. We have a, a really important agenda, and uh, it, it would make sense, it would not make sense, uh, to uh, anger a supermajority of the legislature for having, in a way that won't change anything and, uh, and make sure that we are focused on getting done uh, the, 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 uh, the agenda that the people of Utah want for the, uh, for the next decade. So that's, that's what we're going to be working on. But again, I, I, I understand the frustration and that, that people are feeling right now and, and the place that that should be uh, directed is making sure that, uh, that, that we elect people that, uh, that, that have the same interests that you do. There is a lot of outrage over this process. You've probably seen it online, on TV. So how did we get here and why does it all matter? Shelby Hensey is here to talk about it. She is our producer for KSL Plus and Sunday Edition with Doug Wright. Thanks for being here, Shelby. Yeah, thanks. I'm excited to be here. This is this is my jam. So, Talk about what the legislature is trying to do right now. Yeah, so right now, the legislature, every 10 years, they get the new census data that talks about uh, population and where the population is located, what the growth has been, all of those things. And so every decade, um, we have an opportunity to redistrict 
um, a couple different things. You have congressional districts. So the people um, are federal representatives. Um, and those are, there are four, we can have four districts. Um, then there is a state legislator dis legislative districts. So the House and Senate within state leadership and then school boards. So right now they're building maps to uh, build these districts that we'll use for the next 10 years until we have new census data. And when I, when I look at the question, you know, why does this all matter? Why should we care about the process? Seems like the, the answer I see the most is because representation matters. Absolutely. And, and that is what I think a lot of people are really frustrated with right now. And of course, there's no, um, this is something that every state struggles with and everybody is trying to figure out the best way to do this. And it's just a process that we're all trying to go through right now. So over the last few years, talk about the way uh, we've been building these maps. Yeah. So in 2010, when we had our last round of census data, um, there was a lot of controversy over how the maps got drawn. And in the Utah Constitution, every state's a little different, um, but the Utah Constitution says that the legislature is the group that has the power to create these maps. The legislature will do what the Constitution's charged us to do, uh, which is ultimately select the maps that uh, these elected officials feel like best serve the needs of the state. So in 2010, there was a bunch of controversy over uh, you know, this idea of gerrymandering. Um, these maps are supposed to be made without political consideration. And we'll get a little bit more into that in a minute. But um, you know, both parties were saying the other party you know, did shady things behind closed doors to make these maps. So we really started looking at how can we do this differently, more transparently, and in a way that allows more input from the public um, while still following the Constitution, which said, says the legislature has final say. So the kind of what happened came out of that was in 2018, um, a group called Better Boundaries put forward Proposition 4. Um, and that the goal of that was to create an independent redistricting commission. So there's um, the group is bipartisan and the governor appoints someone and the legislature appoints people and they have to be people who aren't politicians or haven't been in the last four years. There's a whole list of criteria for them. Um, and then they can build the maps and send them to the legislature and have the legislature pick a map. So in 2018, Utahns voted, it was like 59, 50% to 49%, and then some decimals in there that got us over. Um, but we voted to adopt this new method. Um, in the 2020 legislative session, however, the legislators said, no, we don't want to do this. We, the constitution says we have the power to do it. And so we should be the only ones who can work on this. We came to a bit of a compromise um, through a Senate bill that would allow the independent district redistricting committee to still be formed. And then the legislature could also form their own redistricting committee. And then they would vote on maps from the two committees. So that's kind of where, where how we got to where we are today. And another important part of that as well um, in the Proposition 4 is if there was a statute in that, that if uh, people didn't like the maps that the legislature chose, they could sue the state and say, you know, we need to change this. That provision was taken out um, in 2020. Yeah. So there's not a lot of recourse now for if the legislature picks a map that people don't support. So if I'm understanding you right, the the state legislature is not required to take these maps and approve the maps from this independent commission. But there are questions, you know, about, okay, but this, the map that they've put forward 
gerrymandering, like you said, this is favoring one political party. Um, I mean, I, I think that, I don't know, if we just take a look at the four districts, District 4 is sort of the swing district, I guess you could say. Right. And uh, is the criticism that with this new map, it just won't be possible to even, you know, elect a, a Democrat? Yeah, I think that is the biggest criticism right now. I mean, it's bad enough that we have Salt Lake County cut three ways currently under the new map. It's going to be cut four ways, and there's just no good reason for that. You can keep Salt Lake City whole. You can keep most counties in the state whole or with very minimal splits, and this map doesn't do that. You literally cannot uh, create four dis congressional districts and not divide up counties. You can't do it. There's a lot of concern with Salt Lake County specifically. Um, if you like were to walk along 3900 South and go up a couple blocks and down a couple blocks, within like a mile, you could walk through all four congressional districts. Um, so that is a concern for a lot of people, especially considering the fact 90% um, of Utah, Utahns live in an urban or suburban area. That's according to the census. So the, the legislative redistricting committee, their, one of their big goals was to make sure that there was rural um, representation in every district, all four districts. And this map represents rural as well as urban, and we're thankful for the things that you guys have put forward and all the work you've done. And that required chopping up Salt Lake County significantly. The legislature not only has the statutory responsibility for these maps, but we also have the constitutional responsibility for these maps. And that's for, there for a reason. And this narrative out there that we didn't listen to the, the, the better boundaries or the, the independent commission is just false. Because we did take some of their ideas, incorporate them into the maps. I do know that the chairs looked at their maps, the commission members looked at their maps, the committee members looked at their maps, and in drafting the maps, they worked together with, I know, cities, counties, um, uh, all the elected officials, as well as, as, as the, the independent commission. And the ind independent commission didn't do as big a job in doing that, I think, as what the redistricting committee did. And I think the re redistricting committee did their job as per the Constitution, as well as state statute. When we build these maps, uh, there is the, the biggest rule is that they all have to have an equal number of people in each district. So one district can't be larger than the other. Um, one of the goals of the independent redistricting committee was to use something called communities of interest to also help build these districts. So Utahns could go in and submit something called a community of interest, which is a little complicated because it doesn't have an actual like set definition. But the idea of it is, is basically um, keeping groups of people together that have similar interests. So maybe it's a neighborhood that largely speaks Spanish, or it's a neighborhood and a town and area where many of the people are employed by the mining industry and um, those kinds of things. Um, it could be socioeconomic, um, ethnicity, all those kinds of things. So trying to keep um, people with similar interests together as well. But one of the other concerns is we don't really know what the process was with the legislative committee because the independent redistricting committee had many, many uh, public meetings and they put out maps for people to comment on and then they tweaked the maps from those public comments and the legislative committee just kind of made their maps, came forward and said, here they are. I don't think it's fair to say that you guys didn't come out and listen. I just don't know that you listened well. So that's something that we have to consider is I'm hoping you'll, you'll listen to us a little bit today. I think that um, uh, there's maybe uh, an opportunity for us to help explain and and let people understand that we have taken feedback from a lot of different folks. That was part of the dialogue that the committee worked on as they drafted these maps. Um, there's a lot of considerations that were looked at, not just from the independent commission, but from other folks. And so uh, that's, that's the process. Um, 
and uh, elected officials in the legislature take their responsibility really seriously um, to do what they think is right. The concern really is that um, there is no way in these maps for a Democrat to win. And we've seen that mathematically. Um, our colleague Garna Mejia earlier this week did a really great interview with uh, Dr. Jarvis, who is a mathematician at BYU. And he ran, um, he was working with the Independent Redistricting Committee and he ran their maps as well as the legislative maps through a series of algorithms to determine um, what, what the likelihood of people being elected in. And so I wanna make sure we look at his interview a little bit. It's a little long, but it's really interesting. We found that, uh, that the commission's maps were fairly reasonable in their uh, political distribution in the way in the way they respond to different elections and differences in the elections, whereas the legislative committee's map seems to be very strongly uh, biased in favor of the Republican Party. So it does not respond well to changes in voter uh, preferences. Tell me a little bit about the process. What did you do and how did you find this out? So um, what we do is we draw um, 100,000 or more uh, blind maps. So maps that don't take any political information into account, but do try to take account of things that the commission said and that the, the legislator, legislature said in, their, in the statute that set up the commission, that the things that they said were important, uh, like avoiding uh, county splits and trying to be relatively compact and so forth. So we draw a large number of these maps and then after we're done, then we look at how each of the maps uh, responds to each of 10 different elections, but the 10 most recent statewide elections that we've had in Utah. So some elections will be, the voters will vote more in favor of the Republicans and sometimes more in favor, a stronger uh, vote for the Democrats. And because of that, you'll see some variation up or down in the, in the performance of the different maps uh, in terms of how many seats they would give to the Republicans or Democrats. So you're creating all of these possibilities that could happen with, with all of these different people, different voters, different candidates, right? Yes. And then you run uh, mathematical elections to see what those results would look like, to give you an idea of what mathematically or statistically our representation would look like in Washington, D.C. So it, it shows you what kinds of maps are possible or typical in Utah if you're not trying to play any games or not trying to favor one party or another party. So when you look at it, if, 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 the, maps, if the maps that are being proposed behave like that blind collection, that large blind collection, if they have similar distribution, then that, that would indicate that they were not unfairly favoring one party or another. Whereas if they uh, strongly favor one party much more than the blind maps do, then that shows that there's some something unusual going on. And so as you ran this forecast with 100,000 different possibilities, you found that, you know, those results, what were those results? What did you find? So this is looking at the 10 different elections. So the, the governor election in 2016, the Senate election in 2016, all the way up through the uh, presidential election in 2020, the governor election in 2020, and so on. So for each of these elections, you had a different percentage of votes in favor of Democrats and Republicans. So the, the blue line shows the, the actual percentage of vote in favor of Democrats in each of these elections. Okay, just going to jump in here real quick. If you're listening to this and want to see these graphs that he's mentioning, there is a link in the show notes to the video version of this where you can take a look. And, but of course, it's impossible to give fractions of seats, right? So one seat is the most seats that the Democrats would ever have uh, um, among all these elections. The colored dots correspond to the, pl the plans from the commission and from the legislative committee. So the commission had, uh, had 
orange and purple and then the and this public plan they called uh, sh2 so there are those are the orange purple and red dots and the blue dot corresponds to the uh commission the, the legislative committee's plan and you'll see that so for most of these plans for example the orange will sometimes give the Democrats a seat and sometimes not a seat. And uh, then, then they give it back here and back here and so on. Uh, and the, the red will pop up and down and all of them sort of alternate back and forth. But the blue is always giving the Democrats zero seats and the Republicans all the seats. Even when, even when there are more votes in favor of the Democrats or it doesn't really matter how many votes are in favor of the Democrats, you see the blue always giving the same number of seats to the Republicans. So that's just completely unresponsive to that change, the changes in voter preference. So what does that say to you then? I, I can't speak to people's intentions, but I can say that this map is unusually unfair it, or, or it gives undue favor to the Republican party, which is something that was explicitly forbidden by the statute. They were that set up the commission that, that they were supposed to avoid undue favor. And when I see this, that that one that one party always gets all the seats, no matter what the election and no matter how the 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 percentage of vote turns out, you always see this one not moving, even though the other plans move up and down depending on on those things. Thanks a lot, Garner, for that information. And we want to bring back Shelby just for a couple more questions um, as we take a look at this controversial congressional map. Uh, what 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 comes next after all of this? Yeah, so um, as of recording today, um, the House and the Senate just voted on to approve these the legislative maps. I look at this map as having four congressmen representing Salt Lake City. What a powerful map. What a powerful, what a powerful rep representation for our capital city. So those will now go to the governor and like we said a little bit earlier um the governor said he is most likely going to vote for these and the reason he gave for that largely is that they passed by a margin that would be considered veto proof so he could veto it it would go back to the legislature and then they would just reapprove it um and it would just take more time basically and you know, there's arguments for and against vetoing something, even if it is veto proof, you know, to make a statement. Um, maybe that could change some legislators' minds um, if the governor doesn't support it, all those kinds of things. But it doesn't matter because the governor has said he is not going to do that. And he specifically said as well, if you don't like what we've done, vote for different people. And of course, people are concerned with that thinking because when you have districts that are you know very difficult to uh, elect people of different parties from especially it makes it really hard to vote those people in even if um that's what you want to do so now it's just waiting on the governor to see what he says and then um we'll move forward from there and and it's likely that these will be um the the voting districts that we'll use for the next 10 years Shelby Hensey, thanks for joining us here on this week's episode. Of course, she is always involved in every week's episode of Behind the Scenes. Happy to be here. Okay, and like uh, like she said, this is a decision. This is a special session that will impact us for years to come. And so it's a story that I imagine is not going away. But that does it for us this week here on KSL Plus. I'm Matt Rascone, and we'll see you again next week. Thank <laughs> you.